Welcome to UCLA Radiology. This is Susie Muir podcasting from UCLA Medical Center, Los Angeles, California. This is podcast number two, MRI Ankle Anatomy, to be presented by Dr. Derek Lohan. He will demonstrate axial, sagittal, and coronal planes of the ankle and discuss the flexor tendons, peroneal tendons, extensor tendons, and also comment upon six important ligaments. So let's start by considering the anatomy of the ankle joint, more specifically the tendons and the ligaments. The tendons surrounding the ankle joint can generally be thought of as comprising three compartments, the flexor compartment, the peroneal compartment, and the extensor compartment anteriorly. The flexor compartment comprises a number of tendons, the order of which can be thought of by recalling the names Tom, Dick, and Harry. T stands for tibialis posterior. D stands for flexor digitorum. And H stands for flexor hallucis longus. The flexor hallucis longus tendon is most easily identified by noting that it has an associated muscle belly that extends distally much further than does the muscle belly of the other flexor tendons. The Achilles tendon, located posteriorly, is also a flexor of the ankle joint. The peroneal compartment comprises two tendons, the peroneus longus and peroneus brevis tendons. While it may on occasion be difficult to differentiate between these two tendons, it is most readily recalled by recalling that the brevis tendon is most intimately related to the adjacent bone. So we recall B, B, brevis and bone, the bone being the posterior aspect of the fibula. The extensor compartment of the ankle comprises three tendons, the order of which can be recalled by bearing in mind Tom, Harry and Dick. T being tibialis anterior, H being extensor hallucis, and D being extensor digitorum. So these are the tendons surrounding the ankle joint level. Next, we turn our attention to the ligament, ligamentous structures. At the level that we are currently evaluating, we see that the lateral aspect of the tibia has a concavity into which sits the fibula. I am now going to extend further distally and pass over a number of images. And as I do, we'll see that this concavity generally begins to straighten out. So we see here that the concavity is less pronounced. On the next image, again, the articulation is even straighter and on this image, the articulation between the distal tibia and fibula is now almost entirely straight. This is the level of the distal tibiofibular syndesmosis. Again, at this level, we are above the ankle joint level. At this level, we see two very important structures, the anterior and the posterior tibiofibular ligaments. These are very strong ligaments that are rarely disrupted in the absence of severe trauma. It is important to differentiate these ligaments from the lateral ligaments of the ankle that are generally um, of concern when someone sprains their ankle during a forced inversion injury. We will discuss these lateral ligaments in the coming minutes. Over the course of the next few images, which I'm going to briefly just um, scroll over and not comment upon, um, I'm, what I'm going to do is progress to the most distal image on which I still see some of the lateral malleolus. So we can see that the lateral malleolus 
is becoming rather attenuated and we are now extending almost completely distal to the lateral malleolus. This image is the most distal image on which we still see a tiny portion of this lateral malleolus. On this image we see two very important structures, the anterior talofibular ligament and the posterior talofibular ligament. These are very important ligaments that are very commonly disrupted during forced inversion injuries. It is generally held that the anterior talofibular ligament is the first ligament to be torn. This is a normal appearing anterior talofibular ligament. As we see, it is thin, it is of uniform thickness, and it appears taut. The posterior talofibular ligament is similarly taut and of uniform thickness, though it is somewhat thicker and does have associated high signal, which is normal for this ligament. The third lateral ligament of the ankle joint is the calcaneofibular ligament. This ligament is located further distally and is generally identified as a linear structure deep to the peroneal tendons. So as I flick through the next few images, we'll follow the course of these two peroneal tendons and identify a linear structure deep to these tendons, between the tendons and the adjacent lateral aspect of the calcaneus. This linear structure, as I say, is the calcaneofibular ligament. Again, it should be linear, it should be taut, and it should be of uniform thickness. Given the orientation of this ligament, it is generally seen on a number of images on axial acquisitions. Along the medial aspect of the ankle joint is the medial deltoid ligament. This is generally not evaluable on axial images and is best seen on coronal acquisitions of the ankle, as we will see in a number of minutes. One other ligament that we can generally see on axial acquisitions is the so-called spring ligament or the calcaneonavicular ligament. This is located further distally and is identified as a linear structure extending from the anterior aspect of the calcaneus to the medial aspect of the navicular bone and again as with all normal ligaments should be continuous and should be taut. Next we turn our attention to coronal acquisitions of the ankle. Next we turn our attention to coronal acquisitions of the ankle. In general the axial images are the most useful images on which to evaluate ligaments though at times certain ligaments may be uh, evaluated to greater effect on the coronal acquisitions. In general it is the combination of both axial and coronal acquisitions which gives a more universal um, evaluation of the continuity and integrity of these ligaments. Just to disregard, I guess, at first this skin laceration with associated soft tissue edema that was present in this patient. The ligaments in this patient are intact. So, as we go from the lateral aspect here, we see that there are several ligaments. The most proximal of these, and this is along the posterior aspect, extends between the lateral aspect of the distal fibula and the lateral aspect of the distal tibia. This is the posterior tibiofibular ligament at the level of the syndesmosis, as we saw on the axial acquisitions. This ligament is identified on the axial acquisitions, as we said, at the level where the tibiofibular articulation is flat. Further distally, we again see another ligamentous structure, again with a horizontal orientation. This is the posterior talofibular ligament, one of the three lateral ankle ligaments. Next, 
Again, progressing slightly further anteriorly, we get a better, more improved view, again, of the posterior talofibular ligament. Again, it is uniform in thickness. It has some high signal within it, which we said when we evaluated the axial images was allowable, and it appears taut. At this point, we are coming out of the view of the uh, distal tibiofibular ligament. Advancing to the next image, we begin to see the calcaneofibular ligament, which again is a low signal intensity, linear, uniform thickness structure that extends from the tip of the lateral malleolus to the calcaneus. And we recall on the axial images that this was identified as a linear structure deep to the peroneal tendons. Again, we can see that this is confirmed on the coronal acquisitions, a linear structure deep to the peroneal tendons. Along the medial aspect of the ankle, we see a deltoid ligament. This is a, a much stronger ligament, hence ankle sprains generally occur laterally, where the ligaments are less taut. The deltoid ligament has a triangular shape, hence the name, and it comprises superficial and deep portions. Generally, disruption of this ligament requires significant trauma. This is a normal appearance of a deltoid ligament. At this level, we also see a space between the talus and the calcaneus. This is the sinus tarsi. The structures within this space comprise talocalcaneal ligaments as well as fat, both of which are of low signal intensity on this fat-saturated T2-weighted image. In general, ligaments are best evaluated on T1-weighted images. They are of low signal intensity because of their fiber structure. For example, we see here a very beautifully defined calcaneocuboid ligament, a ligament that is not very often identified on MR. This sagittal acquisition also allows us to evaluate the plantar fascia as well as the distalmost aspect of the Achilles tendon. Sagittal images, as I say, are relatively limited in allowing us to evaluate ligamentous structures given the orientation and planes of these structures which are best evaluated on axial and coronal acquisitions. We do, however, see very nicely um, talocalcaneal ligaments at this point. Visit pediatricimaging.wikispaces.com to review our UCLA Radiology resident-run wiki space. There are multiple interesting cases in different specialties to include chest, GI, GU, neuro, musculoskeletal, and angiointerventional.